All right. So hi there. Um, I'm Robin Hall, and I'm going to be continuing today talking a little bit more about uh, pathways and networks. Um, basically, um, um, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit more about what you know Veronique and uh, Ruth introduced you today. Uh, I may repeat a few aspects of that, and that's just to reinforce those ideas and also to, to expand on this. Um, I should just start by saying that um, you know these slides are excuse me one second. These slides are based on um, uh, resources that are created by myself and others, uh, particularly Veronique, uh, Gary. Uh, Lincolnstein and some of the EBI training resources as well. So today, um, our learning objectives for this lecture as follows: to understand further understand the principles of pathway network analysis. I'll talk a little bit more about the sources of the pathway and network data. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the different analytical approaches, and I'll talk about this in the, you know, as a use case: uh, the React Home Functional Interaction Network or the FI Network for short. So um, I'm aware that Gary might have explained this a little bit yesterday, but you know, this is my definition of what network pathway network analysis is. Uh, it's strange after even after 10 years of doing these these workshops, I still think the statement still fits. These statements still fit. Um, I might even have adjust them ever so slightly, but essentially, it's an analytical technique that makes use of biological and molecular network or pathway information to further understanding um, of biological systems biological systems. Um, it still is rapidly evolving, I think, with the changes in uh, high throughput uh, data capture. Um, there needs to be, um, there's always an application for pathway network analysis. And there are many different approaches that are available. Um, and I'll talk about some of them in a few minutes. Uh, why do we do this um, type of analysis, I think? Uh, Pathways and networks are very intuitive to scientists. Um, they do provide a rather useful display uh, for biological, and I would actually argue as well, chemical data as well, because a lot of the omics data sets now are, are exposing, you know, <clears throat> multi-omics. So we're looking at genes, proteins, small molecules, drugs and chemicals, and other environmental toxins. So the whole host of data that you can actually display on pathways and networks. Um, Veronica obviously was, and Gary were talking about how useful these types of analysis are in, for increasing the statistical power by reducing uh, multiple hypotheses. Um, for a lot of the tools um, out there, there's ways in which to actually automate the analysis. So when you're actually processing large data sets, whether you're used using APIs um, or features built into desktop software, um, this can certainly make these um, uh, analytical approach is much more efficient. And then pathway and network analysis satisfies a number of, you know, common use cases in biological research. Um, talks about identifying patterns in hidden gene, in hidden patterns within your gene lists, um, a way to explain experimental observations. Uh, we can predict the function of unannotated or understudied proteins. I may talk a little bit about another project that we're working on uh, in Reactome later that would best describe this. Um, also for, um, you know, pathways and network graphs are very useful in establishing a framework for quantitative modeling, um, and also uh, assisting with the development of identifying molecular signatures. Um, just as here's a real world example, um, you know, there's, you know, several groups uh, that uh, compose part of the Cancer Genome Atlas project, identified 127 genes. Uh, which they classified as cancer um, driver um, uh, genes based on the mutation frequency. And if you look at these uh, genes as a list, um, we don't really know what these 127 genes are doing and why these mutations may be causing cancer. And pathway network analyses try to relate these genes to pathway and network annotations and other functional interactions and I'll talk a bit more about this example and some of the tools that I'm gonna demonstrate later. Um, and just to take a moment uh, to remind us about, you know, what a pathway and what a network is. 
um, and I'll further define some of the kind of characteristics of these pathways and networks in, in subsequent slides. But essentially a biological pathway is a series of actions that occurs within the molecules within the cell uh, that leads to a certain product or maybe a change in the cell. So, um, you know, we're aware of there's metabolic pathways, which are very much similar to like chemical reactions that occur within our bodies, bodies. You know, the conversion of glucose to energy, for example, is one. The signal transduction pathways that move the signal uh, from the cell's exterior to its interior. And then the gene regulation pathways that turn genes on and off. Uh, for a network, um, with a pathway, you kind of classically think of there being a start point um, and an end point, you know, top to bottom, as you can see on the left side. But um, for networks, they don't necessarily have a start or end point. And, you know, some people think that um, pathways have no real boundaries and pathways kind of often work together to accomplish different tasks. Um, and when multiple biological pathways uh, interact with one another, they form a biological network. And, you know, researchers are able to learn a lot about human disease from studying biological uh, pathways and networks um, and identifying what genes, proteins and other molecules are involved in a biological pathway or network can provide clues about what goes wrong when, when disease strikes. Um, pathways have the following advantages. Um, typically, they're, um, they're usually curated, that is to say, you know, um, uh, a researcher uh, reads uh, a paper, identifies the knowledge within that paper and translate that into a, uh, a computable form, uh, does, you know, essentially data entry, that data becomes available through a database, and the resources are available online. <clears throat> Typically, pathways are um, a biochemical view of a biological process, you can capture cause and effect. Um, and there's traditionally some form of human interpretable visualization, either a textbook like illustration, or maybe a more technical network view. And I'll describe this more in a sh shortly. One or, or Robin, sorry, can I, I'm going to interrupt here. Yes. Can you uh, give a quick definition of what curation is? Yeah, curation. Um, yes. As a former member of the international <laughs> curation community and yes. host of a curation conference. Yes, that's that's very true. Thanks, Francis, for the reminder. Co-host, co-host of it. Yes. Um, Francis and I worked together uh, to host a biocuration conference a number of years ago. Um, and essentially, biocurator is an individual, and uh, I would say that they're usually um, a postgraduate. Um, they've got usually postgraduate qualifications and they're typically, you know, in the case of a bio curator, they have a biology background um, or, you know, they might have a background in chemistry um, or some other or some other science discipline. And obviously we're, over our years, we've been very uh, <clears throat> experienced in reading papers and extracting information from those papers. And basically a curator does is I shouldn't I should is is the the read papers they identify the information and those that information um, will be captured in a in a database uh, there'll be basically there'll be kind of a, like a web form or some tool that they use to capture that knowledge in the database um, now a good curator will also review that information for other curators as well that's kind of like a process of peer review uh, some other process, some other organizations have an external uh, peer review system so that knowledge is actually um, uh, reviewed, uh, just very much like a paper publication. And then that data is obviously made available online, um, either for download or through different web tools that are available. Um, does that help answer that? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think it's a, um, I think it's important to, to state that there is such a job out there. So people with PhDs mm. doing this kind of work. And yes. so that's another sort of avenue for people to think about sort of uh, is to, and then a good thing to do is to give an example of a specific database and how that varies from one database to another. So Reactome, which we're going to hear right. about today, is a, is a recruits many by curators of different types. Some are full time, yes. some are part time. Right. And um, likewise, I used to work at, at GenBank and then CBI, and 
and we had I had about 20 25 curators there and they're all sort of 95 percent like PhD level sort of scientists that uh, worked on uh, the, the mechanics uh, reviewing and curating and making sure that the, 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 the there's a lot of things to worry about like identifiers and understanding the, the data model of the database right but also ensuring that the there's a human sort of biological review that's going on in the process so I think that's an important part of the of the of databases in general and biological databases be it pathway or sequence or or or, or chemicals yep. that there's this sort of human review that often takes yeah. place that's not uh, taken into people don't think about it very much no i think that's a very good point i do come across on that further down in my talk but i will make it now and i'll repeat it again later but it is uh, a lot of manual curation is it's human intensive it does take time but it typically if it's done right and consistently will create a kind of gold gold standard data set yeah. which is, from an experimental biologist perspective is like presumed like, actually most experimental biologists using a database assume that that takes place it but, does <laughs> but it's not but always it, the case no and, exactly and, and you, and have, you to be, have to be careful about that and, and i'll yeah. also I'll brush upon this later um but yeah no thanks for bringing that up francis um there are come a disadvantages of pathway databases i kind of just mentioned one there you know it's time consuming but also our focus is rather it's it, it's smaller scale and then sometimes in times of in terms of the curation um there can be a sparser coverage of the genome um and certainly different da pathway databases do do disagree on the boundaries of pathways um and some of these disadvantages are met by people using um networks but um continuing along you know, the kind of gold standard pathway databases out there are really like Reactome, I, which obviously I work for, but also there's KEG and there's Wiki Pathways, these kind of like reaction based pathway databases where the unit of the pathway itself is essentially the Reactome, where each node uh, represents a biomolecule and each edge represents the conversion of one or more biomolecules into another via a reaction. And we can use multiple um, entity databases to reference and describe these different molecules. Um, and we can use things like genontology terms um, and you know, PubMed, PubMed citations to kind of explicitly describe key elements of that reaction. Um, and then obviously these kind of reactions become modules or like big building blocks kind of fixed together like jigsaw pieces to build that pathway. Now, one other you know, good pathway resource out there um, is keg and it's probably like the kind of uh, uh, yeah. focus on other types of knowledge capture so it is actually a collection of biological information obviously it's a manually curated resource but it doesn't just focus on pathways um, now the path keg pathways themselves do contain information based on the genes proteins um, you know, molecular interactions and other reactions associated with multiple organisms. Probably it's one of the few databases uh, that captures a whole host of species. Uh, Reactome and Wiki Pathways are a little bit more focused. Now that does raise a question. How can you manually curate, you know, hundreds of pathways across hundreds of species? And the answer is you don't, you can't. So you're going to fix it on a handful of key organisms that it could be bacteria, it could be human, uh, it could be one of the key model organisms which you will manually curate and you'll use a process called using orthology prediction. And that's based on the fact that proteins or, or genes and proteins are conserved across species and you will build up a model of, based on conservation that you will basically take your you know, say, for example, your human pathways, and you will project that information based on orthology data into another species to create a predicted uh, collection of pathways. Sorry, uh, Robert, does the KEG database, which is uh, out of Kyoto, for those people that don't know, yes. is, does it, um, it used to be that it would uh, not re be really good at separating sort of uh, it would mix up multiple organisms in one pathway. Does it still do that? 
they they still have a kind of reference pathway which could be considered like um a kind of a hybrid pathway okay. um uh, clearly when you're <clears throat> when you're looking at some pathway databases we always talk about the evidence of the source of the interaction and if, for example in reactome even though we're talking about a human pathway certain interactions are only mouse but have been only ever demonstrated in mouse yeah. so we can infer that basically i mean that the, the chances are that that mouse reaction does occur within the human cell but we have to just basically say look this is where the evidence lies and we will make a prediction strong prediction i would say um and we will clearly label that so when you're navigating through the human pathway you'll see that information it's not as clear i think in keg the, the distinction between what is human and what is mouse mm -hmm. and what is rat you know for example <clears throat> anyway they do provide these kind of uh, nice simple pathway diagrams um, green boxes represent the proteins uh, the white boxes represent the genes uh, you can have these you know encapsulated pathways you know pathways that are maybe you know embedded within another pathway just here like a map kind of map cycling pathway and then the kind of lines here are providing different levels of um, representation of the reactions that in, that uh, link different entities uh, to uh, together um, now react on the other hand uh, unlike keg which is licensed is open source open access pathway database uh, we do focus on manual curation of human pathways involved involved in metabolism signaling and other biological processes all that knowledge is traceable back to the primary literature and we provide tools for data analysis and visualization just an example here uh, this is the pathway browser that you use to navigate through uh, biological pathways in reactome uh, it allows you also to analyze experimental data whether that's a gene protein or a small molecule list uh, you see the pathway hierarchy here on the left uh, just is listing all the different uh, pathways and events molecular events in reactome and as you interact with this level you see these kind of pathway these textbook like illustrations on the, the pathway viewport here um, and then you kind of see some other um, pathway annotation information in the details panel below here um, in this example uh, we're actually looking at that 127 cancer gene list that I introduced you at the start. It's been it's it's been um, uploaded into Reactome tool, performed over representation analysis, and the results have been overlaid onto the signal transduction uh, pathway. So anywhere where there's a gene hit, uh, you'll see uh, a list. You'll see like uh, this particular pathway here, which is integrin signaling. You can see the the yellow line is illustrating a hit. So is it a gene list, uh, a gene from the list uh, is a, you can find an appropriate annotation in this pathway. And this details panel here below is showing you this kind of list of significant pathways. I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in the lab later this afternoon, or actually later this morning. Um, now there is kind of segue into kind of talking about biological networks. There is this one large, uh, really useful repository of pathway and network information out there that's called pathway commons um, it really provides an, uh, a very you know if you don't necessarily want to use the react just the reactum uh, pathway annotations that are out there uh, it's a really convenient access point to biological pathway knowledge uh, you know to use the pathway commons resource you can search visualize and you can download a whole host of pathway network information there um, so moving into kind of talking a little bit more about biological networks um many different types of information can be represented in the networks themselves uh, i think ruth did a, a very good overview of this uh uh yesterday uh just to remind you nodes represent many different types of entities they can be genes proteins um the edges themselves traditionally convey uh, the information about the links between these nodes um, and you have to be aware of the you know the knowledge within the network particularly when you're performing the analysis since different algorithms will be uh, applied to different networks um, and different types of data will produce different um, network characteristics in terms of connectivity complexity and structure and i'll talk about that in the remaining slides particularly in the context of protein protein interaction networks uh, since they are probably the most commonly described network out there um, these are graphical representations of the physical context uh, between proteins um, within the cell uh, 
uh, the interaction networks themselves are essential. Sorry, the protein-protein interactions are essential uh, to almost every process in the cell. So understanding these interactions uh, are crucial for our understanding of cell physiology and normal and disease states. Um, you know, protein interactions themselves can represent uh, uh, both uh, uh, transient and uh, stable interactions. So stable interactions are formed in kind of protein complexes, uh, say for example, like the ribosome. Uh, and then transient interactions are kind of what are called these brief interactions that may modify or uh, carry uh, a protein uh, leading uh, to further change. And a good example of that would be something like a protein kinase. And I think that, you know, the transient interactions constitute the most dynamic part of the interactome. And the interactome essentially is the totality of the protein protein interactions that can happen within a cell um, or in a specific biological context, whether that's um, whether that's a you know studying the interactome of an organelle, for example, of life. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and the development of large-scale protein protein interaction screening techniques has created a kind of large volume of interaction data that's available through a variety of different molecular interaction databases. And traditionally, the kind of first step in performing protein-protein interaction network analysis is, of course, to build the network. And there's plenty of different sources of protein-protein uh, interaction data. Um, you can source that data yourself from your experimental work, and you will potentially choose how that data is represented and stored. Um, you can also extract the information from the literature, uh, either manually through your review of these publications, um, or we traditionally, and, and probably the easiest way is to actually um, d derive the experimental data from a host of uh, different protein-protein interaction databases, because their job has been to extract, uh, just as we were talking earlier about the curation process, to extract those protein-protein interactions from the experimental, with the experimental evidence that's been reported in the literature. Um, and I've listed some of the different protein-protein uh, interaction sources that are out there. Um, and they capture a great deal of information about the interactions. Uh, and, you know, they may differ a little bit in terms of the quality of the data that they capture, the amount of metadata that they store, maybe the species that they're actually focusing on, whether that's human interactions, mouse interactions, or yeast interactions, for example. And um, uh, just one second. Um, it's obviously, you know, you know, as a, as a user of interaction data, you have to be aware of where this data comes from um, because no single, I think no single um, interaction database, excuse me one second. Okay, sorry about that. My son is uh, in class today. You okay? Okay, oh. sorry about that interruption there. Um, so, sorry, where I was talking about uh, being aware of the source information. So, so is um, there so is there one database that has everything? If you were answer, you're about to answer that question, well, it, 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 I was going to say that I think that, that truly, uh, I mean, I think uh, you know, databases that I've worked off in the past, you know, used to have very large, and they'll remain nameless, have uh, <laughs> have usually had like a large quantity of data. It depends on the organism you're interested in. If you're looking at human data. I would say Intax and Mint have quite a large amount of interaction data, but you know their primary sources of interaction data, and the, you know you have to look at some of the times you have to look at the websites that aggregate a lot of interaction data from different sources. So does Intax aggregate things from Mint? Intax and Mint do aggregate from other. I mean, part of this IMAX, which I didn't explain, is this um, international collaboration of researchers of interaction databases to kind of exchange interaction data. And they're supposed to provide, you know, they're supposed to manually create their own data, but also provide, um, you know, data from the other sources as well. Um, and, you know, I haven't done a comprehensive evaluation of how each of these different partners does actually aggregate data from the other sources. But, you know, some sources may not necessarily focus on human data. You know, they could be focusing on yeast data and so forth, or, or you know, data from Arabidopsis. So um, the point I'm trying to make is it's sometimes important for you to, to combine data from multiple sources. 
Um, and you have to consider like what type of data they're capturing so that you're avoiding things like redundancies or inconsistencies within that data. Because as much as we like to think that a lot of the data is correct, and most of the time it is, and we put quality control measures in place to actually to confirm the information that's being described is accurately capturing the right molecules and such, there can be some mistakes. You know, it, so, does, um... it does occur. So uh, Sabri asked an interesting question on, on uh, Slack about if you know of any AI projects where they'll be extracting information from publications in the literature in general to uh, include into certain databases. Um, I should know about this and I can't think of any off the top of my head right now that are AI space. There is like, pro like text mining type of approaches that I'll talk mm -hmm. about in a moment. In fact, it's the, probably the next slide, if I actually can move on to that actually right now. Okay. Um, uh, there are resources out there that are using text mining as a way to extract uh, knowledge from papers automatically. Um, and are they looking at deep learning techniques? I would say yes. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of any resources specifically doing this right now, although I should better be able to I could look into that and actually but provide I, that. I, I think that's probably something that a lot of the I think text mining plus uh, whatever tools machine learning type tools become available will definitely support and uh, help the bio creation activities across the board not just absolutely for yeah, yeah. Not just I mean free. yeah yeah, I mean, uh, I think there, yeah, I mean, I think I'm, th I'm trying to think specifically of AI specifically for pathways and the answer is probably yes, there is, but it's not yet available. I know the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, there's a resource called Meta that is mining data from publications and making that data available. Um, also a within, uh, within Gary's lab, there's a project called Factoid. It, it's not and, it's yeah. AI assisted, meaning that you want to give the person who's done the publication, you want to stick yeah interaction kind of thing and have them curate it for you. It's a mixture of AI and uh, involvement by the authors. So there are different types of tools that are trying to be developed. Perfect. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, there's, and um, there are different organizations out there that are using, you know, deep learning, deep, I mean, yeah, deep learning, deep mining techniques to, um, you know, capture different types of information that are being generated from high throughput experiments that are like or and or information that is published in the literature and we're looking particularly right now at variant annotations and their relationship between those variants and particular um How to disease states. interactions and stuff like that yeah yeah so I think, yeah, I think AIs are certainly going to be like very important tools um, for okay. the future. Anyway, so okay. we um, have to move anyway, on. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. we're going to move on here, and yeah. I'm going to, and I think we've kind of covered areas where um, there's, you know, particularly with the the way that we generate network data or the data that becomes part of these protein protein interaction databases. You have to be aware of the experimental approaches that are used, um, the methods, because this could point to limitations in the availability of some uh, protein protein interaction data and how much weight you should apply to trusting whether those interactions actually occur within a particular system that you may well be studying. Because um, there are some limitations in these uh, detection methods um, as to whether you know these are truly physiological interactions that actually occur within the cell. And there's times when these large scale experiments you know to you know generate false positives and negatives in their results and you know there's always a question as to you know when you perform these kind of experiments you know does the in vitro experiment mirror what actually occurs in the in vivo interaction so moving along um we'll talk a little bit more about uh the, some of the kind of principles of network analysis uh one of the key principles uh is with um, working with the complexity of the network is to extract uh, kind of useful information that you would not otherwise have learned by examining the individual components. Um, <clears throat> so analyzing the kind of topological features of a network is rather useful uh, 
uh, in identifying relevant participants and substructures within the network uh, that may have some biological significance. And you know the topological properties of the network um, can be applied to the whole network, uh, or it could be applied to individual nodes, or edges, or uh, parts, different parts of that network. And there's different strategies that we can use to do this. Um, and there's some principles to think about in terms of the network as well that help us to um, uh, understand the topology of networks and how the analytical approaches work. Uh, and one of them is called the small world effect. Uh, I think Ruth introduced us to the little bit the, this yesterday, uh, and this is my take, a slightly different take on it. Um, and, and it's basically about the maximum number of steps separating any two nodes um, is typically small, no matter how big the network is. And this is this whole notion of six degrees of separation. And the reason we study things like this is that this is level of connectivity allows for like efficient and quick flow of information within a biological network. Um, but it does pose an interesting question. And that is, if a network um, is so tightly connected, why, why doesn't perturbations in a single gene or protein um, have a more dramatic consequences for that network? Um, because biological systems are, are extremely robust and can cope with relatively uh, uh, high degree of perturbation uh, within single uh, genes or proteins. And in order to explain this, um, we uh, need to look at another fundamental property of uh, protein-protein interaction networks. And uh, this is what we call scale-free networks. Um, so this uh, basically um, is that a number, um, uh, the majority of nodes in a scale-free network have only a few connections to other nodes, whereas some nodes um, are connected to many other nodes in the network. So basically what this allows us is those failures that occur randomly within the network, the vast majority of the proteins that are within a small degree of connectivity, uh, the likelihood is that that um, hub, you know, the larger interactions would be affected is small. So, and where, so basically if you see, you know, you know, um, you know, an, uh, if we looked at an interaction um, just between, say, for example, um, this node here and this one here, say we lost this interaction here, this node, sorry, you would potentially lose this interaction. But, you know, you'd still, this major hub here would still have all these other interactions and the rest of the network would be unaffected. But if you start losing some of these kind of hubs, these larger, these larger hubs here, so you lost this one, um, the generality is the network will not lose its connectiveness because these, all these other hubs are still performing, these other interactions are still occurring. So this might not necessarily affect the remainder of the, the functionality of this network. Um, but again, when you see major failures in other hubs, um, then you're going to see, um, you know, the appearance of more isolated graphs. That is to say, you know, this may become an isolated graph over here from this and this and so forth when you start losing these interactions. Essentially, what we find is these hubs are like enriched with essential or lethal genes. So, for example, like cancer linked proteins are hub proteins like P53 or EGFR or uh, P10, for example. Uh, another concept to think about is a path, and this is, you know, this distance. Um, path is a, basically a, a sequence of connections that occur within the graph. And then the distance, um, you know, the distance is, well, the distance between two nodes is defined as the number of edges along the shortest path that could be connecting it. Um, so you can see here in the middle here, uh, there's one hop to this node here, it's two hops to this node here, and so on. And we can describe all these different distance and um, uh, connectivity as, as, a, as, as, as a means to measure centrality. Uh, this was initially developed for a lot of social networking analysis. And centra what centrality is, is it gives a kind of estimation on how important um, a node or an edge is for connectivity and that kind of information flow through the network. And there's different metrics that we can use to calculate uh, centrality. 
Um, so the, one of the degree is term degree describes a local centrality um, and doesn't necessarily take into consideration um, the rest of the network. And the importance that we give on that value of degree uh, depends strongly on the size of the network. And I'll use this graph here as a dis in a moment just to describe each of these different terms. Um, there is um, uh, more global centrality measures that we can look at the whole network. Uh, sometimes this is called, some, one of them is called uh, betweenness or betweenness centrality. And basically this looks at the central node. Uh, and the question is, is a central node that provides the kind of shortest path uh, between nodes? And these nodes are powerful because um, in the sense that the extent that is needed for that information to be conveyed, conveyed between uh, nodes um, and in how many shortest paths there exists. I'll, and I'll show this in a moment again with this in this uh, slide. The other one is closeness. And this is measured by the closeness of a central node to other nodes and is useful in estimating the kind of flow of information um, through a given node to other nodes in the network. Um, so the, let's just look at everything in the, in the context of the blue node here. Um, so degree tells me that there's dependency. So these are the local nodes. If you follow the cursor to the single node here, that's degree. Closeness, basically the closeness to all other nodes, okay? So there's one, two node, two hops to this node here, okay? And there's one hop here. So at most, the furthest distance that you need to go is basically to get to any node, whoops, lost my cursor there, is whoops, is going one, two. One, two, or you could go one here, depending on the flow of the information. Between this, it's basically looking at the fact that this blue node here is connecting the right side of nodes to the left side and vice versa. Okay. There are other network features to consider. For example, um, you know, we're looking. You can also consider the size of the network, the number of nodes within that network, the density of the network, so the proportion of the connections that exist, and then there's these other kind of higher order um, organizations that you see within the 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 network, such as motifs, feedback loops. We sometimes call them cliques or other small work network patterns that are. We try to identify those that are overrepresented where compared to randomized versions of the same network. And obviously one other, uh, you know, that touches upon particularly with the, the tools we're about to discuss is this idea of clustering coefficient or uh, transitivity. Um, and this just, you know, describes the kind of modular connections that occur within, uh, you know, networks as a whole. So high transitivity or high clustering coefficient means that the network contains communities or groups of nodes that are densely connected internally. And by looking at these communities in a network, it's a nice way or a nice strategy for reducing the network complexity and extracting functional modules, for example, protein complexes that reflect the biology of the network. And there are several terms that are commonly used when we're talking about these different clustering analyses uh, approaches. Uh, and I'll talk about them in a moment. Um, the other things to think about here are that no assumptions are made about the internal structure of the communities. We're just looking for like high density regions uh, within the graph. Um, and um, it's important to note that there's, um, that finding the best community structure is it's algorithmically complex and is only possible for very small networks. Um, and there's a whole host of other tools, out there, sorry, algorithms out there. Um, and I don't, I'm not, for the benefit of time as well, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about things like Markov clustering algorithm, there's fuzzy C means, uh, there's Chinese whispers clustering, there's newman gervin algorithms, there's hotnet. Um, there's a whole different approaches to identify basically within these larger networks, uh, you know, these modules of tightly connected genes from which you can then um, 
perform annotation enrichment analysis to kind of label these modules, these pathway modules. So annotation enrichment analysis, uh, obviously Veronica and Ruth talked about this earlier, uh, the other day, uh, it's not strictly speaking a network analysis tool, um, but it is one of the more important methods to understanding the biological context of protein-protein interaction networks. Um, there are different variety of uh, analysis tools out there. Um, the most basic form is annotation enrichment analysis for using some, um, <clears throat> which uses um, gene or protein annotations uh, provided by a you know pathway knowledge base or maybe a gene ontology uh, to infer which annotations are overrepresented in the list of genes um, that can be taken from a network. And essentially, these annotation tools perform some additional statistical test that tries to provide us with a list of terms that describe the whole network or part of that network. And so typically, you know, just in summary, the kind of steps that you may use in the network of visualization analysis is, you know, we talked about, you know, um, obviously creating that network of protein protein interaction protein interactions. Sometimes you can use the soft, some software tools out there and the next slide will show some. Um, you upload your experimental data. It's usually in a table format. Um, you, you can, um, through the software tools, you can navigate through your created network. And essentially once you've created your network, you know, you can navigate through the network to understand the relationship between the nodes and the edges. And, the, and you know, you can perform different types of analysis, uh, network analysis using clustering tools to identify uh, modules of interest. Um, and then you can annotate these modules with, you know, pathway or go annotations. And then the idea is to kind of export this um, as an image for a publication. Um, most of the tools, um, obviously yesterday, and we will continue today, you know, we'll focus on using Cytoscape. But uh, there are other open source, you know, tools out there for, uh, the, you know, for network based analyses. Um, a lot of data science is now focused on R and bioconductor. And even within there, there's a number of different, um, a lot of data analysis workflows are actually already established through R and bioconductor for bioinformatics analysis. But uh, I think there are other, um, graph-based tools that are, are, that are out there to explore data. Um, but I think majority of people focus on things like Cytoscape just for its ease of use and also the fact that uh, it does provide programmatic solutions for scripting um, and data linkages, sorry, and linkages between the platform and some of these other, you know, R platform, for example. Um, but, you know, there are different tools um, your needs could be different. Um, some of you are familiar with Python or C. So there are network analysis platforms and tools out there for Python. I think there's network X, ne ne sorry, yeah, network X. Yes. And for Python and C, I think there's something called iGraph. Uh, I'm not a, a C or Python person, so I can't necessarily uh, comment specifically on the individual tools that are out there, but they are being used. Um, but the one that we're going to talk about uh, today in the lab, and I'll start introducing it now because there's a little bit more network function to describe, network analysis um, approaches to describe here. Uh, and this is the Reactome Functional Interaction Network and the Reactome F5 is app for Cytoscape. And um, basically the idea here is analyzing, analyzing your list of genes or mutated genes in a network context allows you to understand the relationship amongst these genes. Uh, you can elucidate the mechanism of action of drivers or maybe the interaction between these driver uh, drivers and the kind of rare mutations that are out there and facilitate some form of hypothesis generation of the role of these genes in, in a disease phenotype. Essentially, um, you know, you're taking network analysis is basically reducing you know, hundreds or maybe thousands of genes within your list down to uh, a dozen or so um, altered or mutated pathways. So what's the functional interaction? 
Um, it's a reliable biological network that's based on manually, you know, interactions derived from manually curated pathways and extended with verified interactions. And the starting point is breaking down these pathway, the reactions of a pathway into binary interactions. And once you do that across a variety of different data sources, here shown on the right, you can create this uh, group of kind of what we call annotated F uh, functional interactions or annotated FIs. And then you can train and, and use a naive Bayesian classifier to look at the features of um, uh, other protein-protein interaction databases to identify um, you know, what we call these predicted FIs. Um, and you basically combine that information together to create the functional interaction network. And as it stands, the network consists of 436,000 interactions and 13,000 proteins. Um, and we rebuild this network every year. <clears throat> so basically how this, this, this app works is that um, you start by projecting your genes into a large FI network. Um, so the, the red and purple genes are the red, the red and purple nodes are just representing uh, data from your experimental data. Obviously, these nodes will have uh, relationship information so that you can start creating the sub network. Um, but you can still see that some sparse connections. So, what you can do is you can potentially add a linker gene. And a linker is basically a gene that's not necessarily part of your data set, but it's added to the app because it's adding a link between two genes uh, in your list and it increases the power for data interpretation and enrichment analysis. Of course, those nodes have those connections and you basically remove the remainder of the network that's not necessarily part of your data set. And what you're left with is, is a sub network based on your data. I do apologize. I've realized this is yellow lines and a white background, but um, this is the kind of the idea of creating a, a small subset sorry, a sub-network based on your experimental data from a much larger network. And just as an example here, we're gonna run through um, generating a sub-network um, and try to annotate, identify modules of interest within the network and then annotating those modules uh, with pathway annotations. And this is using this 127 cancer gene list that I introduced at the start of the presentation. So I've uploaded the gene list, created the network, perform the network analysis, annotated the modules. So this is the network that's created based on these genes. There's these four modules, uh, one, two, three, and four. And then through enrichment analysis, um, you can label these modules with different um, pathway annotations. So we're looking at receptor tyrosine kinase signaling here, um, signaling by notch, beta, wnt, sorry, notch, wnt, and TGF beta as components of the cell cycle, and then this TP53 signaling as well here. So basically what you've done is reduce that 127 mutated genes down to a handful of altered pathways. You can also use, um, you also can combine um, gene expression data into the reactive MFI network to search for uh, network modules related to patient uh, survival. Um, so just in this example, the first step is to calculate the gene expression correlation for the genes involved in the functional interactions. And then you can assign those correlations to the FI network to weight it. And then you use the MCL network clustering algorithm to kind of identify uh, the modules of interest. And within the Reactom FI uh, app, you can uh, choose uh, two types of uh, survival analysis, survival module analysis to um, there's one called Cox proportional hazards and the other is called Kaplan-Meier. And in the case of the Kaplan-Meier analysis, samples are basically divided, clinical samples are divided into two, group, two groups. In this case, it's based on expression values. So there's gonna be one group where you see expression, um, low expression genes, and that's the red line. And then the other group uh, is uh, high expression genes in the module. And basically the result here uh, was the identification of a 31 gene module uh, whose expression was significantly related to breast cancer patient survival across uh, 
five independent samples. This module here is actually involved in cell mitotic apparatus assembly. Um, there's basically two different types of annotation. There's the purple that came from the reactant pathway database, and the orange was from the NCI uh, pathway interaction. Basically, the conclusion of the study was that uh, patients with low expression um, uh, of these module genes uh, fared better than patients with high expression of module genes. Uh, and the take-home message here is that um, a single network module instead of modules could be used as a signature of uh, patient prognosis. Um, so in the final section of my talk, we're going to talk a bit more about pathway modeling approaches, um, where we are we're going to, uh, I will talk a little bit about pathway modeling. It can also be sometimes referred to as network-based modeling as well. Essentially, there's different computational approaches for modeling pathways um, based upon uh, either this, this network-based method or mathematical modeling. Uh, so basically, um, network-based methods apply graph theory to discover uh, the relationships amongst nodes in the pathways where each node um, uh, represents a, a biological entity like a gene or a protein, and the edge represents the interaction between uh, the, the node pairs. Um, and uh, one example of this is probabilistic graph modeling that I'll talk a bit more about in the moment. Um, the important idea here is to kind of preserve some of those um, detailed biological relationships in the modeling process. And the other approach, which is to take mathematical modeling, uh, learns and analyzes the underlying network by transforming the reactions and entities into a matrix form. So there's several different approaches here to study biological pathways, uh, such as Boolean networks, uh, which could be used to represent large scale signaling networks. There's ordinary differential equations that can be used to provide uh, quantitative models of small size gene regulatory networks. And then there's stochastic and flux balance analyses that are usually used for the study of metabolic pathways. Um, basically, the, the idea here is that both these computational approaches can be used to infer how pathway states are disrupted within a disease. For example, in cancer biology, um, it uses both quantitative and qualitative modeling. Uh, sorry, quali quanti qu both qualitative and quantitative measurements to infer the activities of various genetic components of the pathway. And it's somewhat akin to systems biology. Um, and just in this, this graph here, I'm just showing you kind of the flow of ideas that are the flow of information uh, within the pathway modeling using different computational approaches. Um, the uh, bioinformatic methods for pathway or network modeling typically start with a hypothesis, which can be derived from your experiments or, your th or, or from some theory. Um, you can then use computational methods uh, to based on uh, your experimental data, that could be gene expression information, and then including uh, knowledge information um, like functional annotations to kind of model the biological pathways. Um, and then um, you basically create a model, a predicted model, pathway model, which can be refined by evaluating each model with the experimental and the hypothesis against this experimental data and the hypotheses. You can collect further information by searching the literature um, or databases, retrieving additional pathway or interaction data uh, to basically further define or modify the models. Um, you can run different types of simulations using different uh, mathematical modeling approaches. You can compare the simulations. Um, and then in some cases, you typically will perform additional analysis with the multi uh, analytical approaches. And then you try to create uh, a figure for publication. So <clears throat> the types, uh, just continuing along in the classical pathway modeling that's out there. Um, there are tools uh, to study uh, metabolic pathways. There's a cell analyzer. Uh, it's a MATLAB tool that's for analyzing the structure and the function of biological networks. 
Uh, they provide kind of a variety of different strain, uh, sorry, algorithms for um, uh, computational strain design, metabolic flux analysis uh, within regulatory and cellular networks. Um, if you're looking at disease uh, or computational modeling uh, of signaling pathway, there's tools like um, Genome Explorer, NetForest, or Networking. And these tools basically uh, can elucidate the kind of phosphorylation events associated with a given phenotype or disease condition. Um, and then if you're looking at things with like uh, gene expression studies, uh, there's tools like Arachne um, that um, allow you to process microarray expression data to model regulatory networks in mammalian cells. And then there's a whole host of other um, applications that are available through Cytoscape, uh, like amino petri dish that perform different types of network inference, network modeling, pathway modeling approaches. Um, now I realize I'm kind of running close to 11 right now. Am I okay to continue a little bit more in the talk? I should be wrapped up with sure. five minutes, I think. Five minutes. Not a problem, Robin. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And we're going to do the picture afterwards, and and Gary is, is late, so so it's all good. Okay, great. Um, so getting back to uh, probabilistic graph modeling uh, based uh, uh, pathway analysis, um, it's one of these kind of widely used techniques in machine learning and statistics for uh, modeling complex dependencies amongst multiple variables. Um, There and the idea here is to integrate multiple molecular alterations to yield a list of altered uh, pathway activities. Um, so the idea here is to apply multiple omics data types to uh, understand more about uh, maybe a single patient or a group of patients if you have. Uh, cancer. In this case, we're just using this as an example of cancer network analysis. Um, and they'll use methods such as uh, naive basing. Uh, sorry, I was going to say naive basing classifier, that's wrong. I should say the methods that are being used are BAC networks to learn the cellular networks, to generate now cellular networks from gene expression data. Um, and the goal is basically to integrate multiple data types into the model to find uh, significantly altered pathways and to link pathways and their activities to patient phenotypes. That's what I was trying to say. Um, so Paradigm is a factor graph framework uh, for pathway inference um, on high using high throughput genomic data. The first step is to kind of convert a typical pathway into a factor graph. So we're just using this, uh, this individual uh, a rather simple reaction step here. Um, and it's expanded initially into four nodes, one to represent gene copy number, gene expression, protein level, and protein activity. And a small fragment of the P53 apoptosis pathway is being shown here um, on the left. And then on the right is the converted factor graph. And um, this representation allows us to model many different high throughput data sets, such as gene expression data, um, uh, variant annotations, um, you know, pr protein level of information that's been captured from MS experiments and changes in gene expression. And just in one of the kind of classical studies that developed the paradigm approach, um, they were looking at the glioblastoma multiformity data uh, and the paradigm approach basically identified um, uh, informative subtypes uh, for GBM cancer data. So basically it produced this um, matrix of integrated pathway activities, um, samples and entities were then clustered using hierarchical clustering and the visual inspection kind of revealed uh, four obvious subtypes um, based on the IPAs. 
And the fourth subtype clearly uh, distinct from the other three. So uh, the example is that HIF-1, what the major conclusions from this paper was that HIF-1-alpha is a master uh, transcription factor involved in the regulation of hypoxic conditions. And two of the other clusters, uh, EGFR signature and the inactive uh, MAP kinase cascade involving GADA um, interleukin, trans interleukin transcriptional cascade. And basically the, the conclusion was that uh, this approach discovered that mutations and amplifications in the EGFR um, were present and that this obviously has been previously shown to be associated with high-grade glioblastomas. Uh, and in Reactome, we've implemented the paradigm approach. Um, and this is just using a very simple uh, gene expression regulatory pathway as an example. Uh, example here is where CTFG and NAPA are two transcription factors uh, which regulates cell proliferation. And the idea here with this paradigm approach is you, you can uh, look at um, uh, the expression of these two proteins are controlled by um, CTGF, are controlled by um, YAP1, uh, WTR1, and RUNCS2. And basically, by taking this PGM approach, we can ask questions uh, by converting reactant. We can ask the question, if YAP1 uh, copy number is higher, is CTGF upregulated? Or, oops. Or if uh, NAPA1 activity is high, how likely is that WTR1 is upregulated or maybe RUNX2 is downregulated? Uh, so that's basically where I want to leave the talk. Um, uh, there's a list of different sourced pathway network databases here that are useful to look at. Uh, some other kind of network construction and clustering different approaches that are out there. Um, for the pathway modeling, um, there are links here, and we're off on a coffee break.